People of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, welcome to my Loki Season 2 Episode 1 recap, review, and breakdown. It feels really, really good to be talking about Loki again, and I have to say, I have missed it. Out of all the Marvel Disney Plus shows, I've enjoyed a lot of them. I've covered quite a few of them, not all of them, but one of the ones I enjoyed most when talking about it on the channel is that of Loki. So today we are going to talk about what went down in episode one, getting some theories, break down the aftermath of what happened at the end of season one, of course, with He Who Remains and what this means now going forward. All in all, it's just great to be back with Owen Wilson and Tom Hiddleston's characters. I think they have such a great chemistry and this show just has a good amount of intrigue i guess you could say to it so let's dive into this episode let me know your own thoughts your own theories down in that comment section so right at the beginning we pick up with the statue of kang the conqueror and where they've appeared all over the tva you can see him all throughout the background and we actually see him running away from that conversation he was having with mobius and immediately this is uh, where he kind of jumps off the edge of the building kind of reminded me of attack of the clones anakin skywalker just falling throughout coruscant so it's uh, you know, a kind of a bold thing to do, I have to say right off the bat. I'm going to try and refrain from getting mega nitpicky here, but considering his uh, powers don't work in the TVA and he just jumped off, it's a very good thing that uh, he, he didn't fall to his death. So at this point, Mobius doesn't recognize him. Neither does Casey, which is when Loki gets ripped from this point in time and put into another one. And the reason why they didn't recognize him before is because Loki was actually in the past. So this is something that I really loved about this first episode because I found that through Loki going to different points in time, it unraveled the plot in such a way that gave us a new clue each time as to what was going on, such as when he was in the war room later on where he time slipped into the past in where Kang ruled the TVA and the faces weren't covered up by that mural. Given the ending events of season one with Sylvie killing He Who Remains and this causing a massive ripple effect with the sacred timeline now branching out of control, this is when we see Mobius and Hunter looking at the branches and considering telling everyone the truth about the TVA and how they were plucked from their lives, from the timeline, and that they're all variants. This is when they're informed that Renslayer is missing and that there's a new judge's council in where General Dox and Judge Gamble want to see them in the war room given everything that has happened. And everyone at this point is in kind of, or at least those who know, is in an existential crisis mode, which you can't really blame them for because at least to their knowledge and the memories that they do have intact, their whole existence has somewhat been a lie. Learning that the timekeepers of whom whom they kind of not only looked up to, but Loki worshipped, were robots. There's literally a timekeeper head on the war room table. They themselves have had their memories wiped of their own lives. They haven't been protecting the timeline. They've in fact been destroying every single time they prune a branch, thus basically killing uh, an unthinkable amount of people. So this is when we have Hunter and Mobius in the war room just basically being like, the TVA now needs to change its approach. We can't go back to pruning those branches. But this might prove a little bit difficult with, I suppose you could say, the threat of General Dox and what we see happening towards the very ending of this episode. But meanwhile with Loki, where, where is he at at this point? So this is when he time slips into the war room, except it's in the TVA past with the Kang heads on the wall that hadn't yet been covered up with the mural of the timekeepers. So what's really cool about the Kang heads on the wall is that there's five of them. So this could be representing the Council of Kangs that existed in the past of the TVA, which you would have to think with the way things went down with the Kang war and you know the past there, it eventually led to one Kang being left behind and erasing the memory of the TVA's knowledge of Kangs creating the TVA and all of this, you know, Kang iconography just everywhere, thus leaving he who remains being the only Kang left before that is Sylvie screwed with that. And now I guess 
the cycle is somewhat repeating. But speaking of how I really liked the different points in time being visited through that of the time slips this episode, giving us more clues, in this moment we had Loki play the recording in the war room and he rewinds it and we hear Kang say, you are quite a marvel, Ravonna Renslayer. And he says, I will be proud to lead with you. You made a difference in this war. Thank you for being on my team. Now I really hope and I have to think Think that we're going to get more insight into this pretty soon or maybe eventually this season given her role in the past with Kang especially given that her memory was wiped as well and last season we saw her open a time door and leave the TVA now if we do see her again I assume it could be with perhaps memories being restored this is something that I feel like the episode is somewhat teasing or flirting the idea of to the viewers maybe memories being restored of those in the TVA who have had their memories wiped could be a repercussion of the branching timelines, the temporal loom just kind of messing with everything. So certain characters could be remembering things from a very, very distant past. So now after the events of season one, everyone's going to have to reconcile, especially those within the TVA, that their existence has kind of been a little bit of a lie, I, I guess you could say. So we have Judge Gamble here agreeing to stop the pruning, which is when Loki pops back into the correct, or should I say the present war room from the past. But notice how we did have that scene in where General Dox says that the timekeepers are fake, but they're warning were real. But on the foundation level here with what she actually does end up or what she could end up doing is that General Docs can't quite adjust to her whole life being a lie. Also, it could be in combination with the fact that she rather believed that despite the timekeepers are fake, he who remains in his mission preserving the timeline could still be something worth pursuing. Which also parallels Loki's struggle to also question the methods of he who remains. If it was the right thing to do or not because he even admits that it makes sense. So clearly you are going to have some people, especially like General Docs, who think that maybe the way of He Who Remains or the illusion of the Timekeepers and what they did to maintain the sacred timeline is the way forward. Because after all, through keeping the branch timelines and Sylvie killing He Who Remains, you've now got you know a potential Kang war coming your way. So the parallel with Loki here is that he catches up with Morbius and he explains that he found He Who Remains at the end of time, saying that everything he was doing, the pruning, the preservation of the sacred timeline, it was about preventing more of him. There was no simple choice. There was no other way. And I think this opens up a very intriguing question to the audience because the more you look into it, it's like, okay, maybe just like Loki, you kind of do understand the stance that He Who Remains took. But the thing is, as Loki said, she was so convinced that he was the devil. But again, through killing him, you've now got a potential Kang War coming back. So you know, what really goes on here? Does it just kind of repeat like the past and where, you know, the Kangs start killing each other and then eventually it comes down to one Kang who tries to stop that from happening through doing something like maintaining a sacred timeline. But then you end up with another he who remains. And then what do you do there? Bottom line, it is a bit of a double devil-sided situation. You've got one who will keep pruning different branches, which as, you know, Hunter says, that's not ideal because you're killing loads of people, but at least that way you stop other Kangs from coming about, or you kind of kill the Kang who's enforcing that and then invite another multiversal Kang war to happen. What is the solution here? And this is what makes this plot so exciting. This is where we get to one of my favorite parts in the episode because Mobius is like, well, before dealing with the threat of Kang and what went down with He Who Remains, I need a Loki who remains. So they go to get some help with the time slipping. As we get to RNA, this is where we meet Kehoi Kwan's character named Ouroboros? Ouroboros? OB? I'm just going to call him OB for short. So he recognizes that it's been around 400 years since he last saw Mobius. Yet we very clearly see Mobius somewhat pretend to remember the last time he saw him or almost be able to pull the memory from his head, but not quite. So this could just be referring to his memory being wiped, whereas for OB, for some reason, his memory wasn't wiped. That could be because, as he says, he basically like gets no sleep and he's so far removed from the rest of the TVA that he could actually remember quite a lot. This is when OB recognizes that Loki is time slipping and he's like, well, that's kind of impossible to do in the TVA. And this is when Loki appears to him 
in the past. I really liked the way they approached this scene because we have the past Loki with Obi rippling out into the present, which means that the temporal Aurora extractor was made for Mobius to use in the present. We also learn that Loki has to prune himself because when something is pruned, it's released from time. And after he's pruned himself, the extractor will pull him into the present. Now, the only thing I can kind of nitpick here as much as this is where the critical side of me has to also balance with how much I actually am really enjoying this at the same time. I felt like there was a lot of kind of, ah, isn't it convenient that Loki goes in the past just long enough to have a conversation with Kei Hoi Kwan's uh, OB to then pop back into the present at the right time to then finish the conversation and then move on to the next thing about extracting him. It's like he could have stayed in the past or in a different point of time for the next three hours, three weeks three months but it doesn't happen and he somewhat pops back right after the conversation is done and they need to move on to the next part of the plot now obviously i do understand that they they kind of could still do that and have him just say oh i spent three months before i popped back right here in the present when i needed to but yeah it's just weird how the time slipping works how he returns back to the exact point in time in where he somewhat needs to continue where he left off but as things move along this is where we get to see the heart of the tv and where Obi explains that raw time is refined into physical timeline, except now it's out of control as the branching is overloading the temporal loom. And given that they've now decided they don't want to prune all of the extra branches, because that would mean the death of countless people, Obi comes up with the idea to close the blast doors to protect the TVA while he figures out how to retrofit it to handle all of these new branches in the future. But the thing is, I, I can imagine that you would always need to retrofit Retrofit it because it can always just keep infinitely branching out. So poor Ob probably has his work cut out for him. So this is where we see Mobius getting suited up. I really enjoyed this part of the episode. I loved the visuals of the temporal loom or whatever it is. It was just getting crazy out there. But this is also where Loki slipped but this time into the future. And he had the pressure of also trying to find a pruning stick because he had to match it up to when Mobius was ready and his timer went green. And this is where things got to that very, 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 very intriguing part in the episode where Loki was walking very slowly. I was thinking, hey dude, man, you're like meant to be finding a stick while you're walking so slowly down this corridor. The phone was ringing at this part as well. And this is when the elevator opens and it is none other than Sylvie, but a very different looking Sylvie to the one we saw in the post credit scene. So I think we'd have to assume that this is, considering this is the future as well, a future version of Sylvie compared to the one we saw go to McDonald's at the end in 1982. And even more fascinating, this is when, as you saw Loki looking very longingly at himself, I mean Sylvie, he gets pruned from behind by somebody who remains a mystery. But I think, and I always regret saying this, I feel like saying it feels obvious to me that this is a future version of himself, just with the whole idea of through doing this to the past version of himself in the future, it then allows him to get to the point of being his future self to prune his past self if you're still with me there. Which is when the credits roll and we get that post credit scene of Sylvie coming out of a time door in a branched timeline in 1982, Broxton, Oklahoma. So this is where we can assume is right after she killed he who remains, she opened a time door and this is where she's now gone to. She then decides to go to McDonald's and her saying that she wants to try everything is likely just symbolizing that through doing what she did to He Who Remains and her drive to doing that stemming from her wanting to be free, free from the TVA last season, if you guys remember. And we also do see in the Loki trailer that she ends up working in McDonald's. So she just seems to kind of be living her best life there, not dealing with the incoming threat of what she's unleashed and what was very much so warned to her and Loki. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next with her character. Because again, I, I know she had a very compelling choice to kill he who remains but she chose that knowing it would invite everything universe destroying as loki said something more malevolent more violent more war 
for the sake of going to McDonald's and living a, a nice chicken nugget life. And uh, I, I, I don't know. So very intrigued to see what develops from here on out. Also super fascinated as to what the elevator scene was about, what the potential Loki was up to through pruning himself and what Sylvie's going to do with that other Loki of whom we think pruned himself in the future. Also, why was the phone ringing? Maybe I'm thinking too deep into that one. It could have just been to kind of lure Loki to the door and we might get a future scene of Tom Hiddleston's Loki just calling that number so it baits him there. Also, we can't forget about the scene with General Docs taking everything from the armory and sending loads of TVA troops to the end of time to find Sylvie. Or at least that is what she said she was doing. And this is when we hear the line of all this for Sylvie, I don't buy it. And I think this just simply comes back to what she said earlier on in the episode where the timekeepers may be fake, but their warnings were real. So it's likely they're going to use the pruning charges that we see in this scene to prune and destroy all of the extra branches. And she's just happy to cause a lot of death that way because she doesn't really know any other way and beforehand with the existence that she's led it has just been one simple thing and one simple order being maintained which obviously would make her another threat in a roundabout way this season because everyone else on the show views pruning now as a very bad thing now as for my thoughts on it overall my review here i really really enjoyed it again i think as with loki season one I can get into some, oh, you know, but does this make sense? Don't ask questions with relation to that. Isn't that maybe kind of convenient? But, you know, with those bits aside, a big part of what shows movies are is entertainment and everything else that can still go into it, of course. And I really did feel like this was a really, really good way to start the season. There, there wasn't really a moment that dragged. The story that is being propped up is really fascinating. It invites a lot of intrigue with the plot, with every new turn of a scene. There's lots of little seeds of what I guess I would say is uh, anticipation being laid down for what's to come with Kang. So you have all of that to digest while it also remains just a little bit of a mystery to keep you locked in. I can go on and on and on about Owen Wilson and Tom Hiddleston's chemistry. I love seeing Loki and Mobius on screen together pretty much all of the time. And the addition of Kei Hoi Kwan is absolutely fantastic. And I can't wait to see more of him, hopefully, as episodes unfold. Of course, we have those other little subplots and threads on the side with like General Docs, of course, Sylvie and what's being teed up there. The issue of the branches and the temporal loom. How is that really going to be controlled? And also just another thing that I haven't really mentioned at all is I really like the way the episode was shot. The camera movement wasn't simple. It didn't just like stay there and it's like, okay, now act in the background. I feel like that's been a big criticism of Star Wars Assault recently. These scenes and the cinematography was always pulling you in. It kind of aided the pacing as the episode unfolded. All in all, it just felt like everything was crafted nicely into this little nutshell. Also, I get a sense, and I may be wrong about this, but this is uh, the Marvel or MCU content that I think a lot of people have been craving for a while. Not saying it's the best thing ever. It's just that there's a lot of commentary on the state of shared universes these days. But when Loki is now released and me looking over what people have been saying about it, people have really seemed to have missed this. Now, I don't know if that's because of the fact that you have kind of one of the original characters of Tom Hiddleston coming back or also not putting down just how entertaining this show is anyway. I would just love to know your thoughts on that. Is this your most entertaining MCU Disney Plus show? Do you feel like this is the kind of MCU content you want to see? If it is, tell me why and why it might be kind of better than what else you've been seeing coming out of Marvel lately. But other than that, ladies and gentlemen, that is everything I've got to say. So if you want me to cover Loki on a weekly basis as I did with season one, let me know by leaving a like on this video. Of course, let me know what you thought about what I had to say. Any theories going into the future? I read every single comment, so can't wait to see what you have to say. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you fellow people of the mcu in the next video goodbye